Hey everyone, welcome to Handing the Shame Back, your number one dedicated channel to supporting survivors of sexual abuse anywhere in the world that you may be. Here is a safe place to land and every week I bring you an interview with a survivor, someone who has been trafficked and for those that are dealing with this type of trauma, you're never alone. I stand with you. Um, it's my great honour this week to bring someone to you from Costa Rica. He's an operator, he's a healer, he's creating awareness through the amazing movie called The Sound of Freedom. So he has on his business card <laughs> DMA, which he tells me doesn't mean anything. Are you getting pulled <laughs> up yet? Uh, but his name is Paul Hutchins and he's the executive producer of The Sound of Freedom. Just as we're launching in though, uh, please do be aware there is a trigger warning. What will be discussed is confronting. Um, but as always, we need to take charge. We need to stand strong and be safe adults for those beautiful children who are being trafficked and abused. So welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Super grateful to be here with you. And I'm so honored by your presence of somebody who's a survivor and uh, who's not only surviving, but thriving. You know, we call them not victims, but victors because we've, we've, uh, we've overcome all things to live a, a healthy life free of the shackles of slavery so I'm, I'm honored to connect with you and with your audience thank you paul and look there's there's so many um so many thoughts spinning around in my head but we now know that the sound of freedom is the number one independent film in the world so congratulations on that and i guess a simple beginning and, and as much or as little as, as you're comfortable to share, Paul. Um, would you like to tell us what led you to this? Absolutely. I, I've, uh, I've always been very involved in, in charity work. In fact, my focus for most of my career has been in, in child-related charities. I've served on numerous boards of directors of different uh, foundations. I was on the Make-A-Wish board of directors. If you haven't heard of Make-A-Wish, they, they grant, uh, um, I call them life-saving wishes to children who, are, who have uh, life-threatening illnesses because you know, when, when you've lost all hope because you're a nine-year-old with cancer or um, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with some, some rare disease, um, having your dreams come true, even for just a moment, gives that glimmer of hope and helps these kids um, have this, this renewed vigor about life and conquering the thing that's ailing them. So I was on the Make-A-Wish Board of Directors for seven years. I was the incoming chairman in our area when I got a call from our attorney general. And he said, Paul, I know that you've been doing a lot to help children. Um, he said, I have something that's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world and good people don't even know that it's happening. He said, there's more today. And I'm not talking about just children that are being abused at home, which is horrible. I, he said, I'm talking sold human beings. There's more today than at all 300 years of the transatlantic slave trade. Put together and um he said there's a homeland security agent and if you've watched sound of freedom movie this homeland security agent was played by jim caviezel and uh so the attorney general said paul there's a homeland security agent who's found some children in cartagena colombia the government won't give him the funding he needs to rescue those kids there's about 20 of them in cartagena and he needed fifty thousand dollars to rescue them and so uh, I introduced him to some of my wealthy investor friends and we helped to make that happen. And then a few weeks later, he called me and he said, Paul, I'm in Cartagena, Colombia. There's not just 20 children being sold here. There's more than 50. And there's more than 100 children that are being sold in other sex trafficking rings in, in areas around Colombia. He said, we could rescue all 100 children on the same day. 
and uh, but I need your help. And I said, well, well, how much how much do you need? I thought that he needed money. He said, I need you. Can you be in Colombia in two days? Now I was a I was a rich real estate investor who had had some training. I had had training on Krav Maga and hand-to-hand -hand combat and other self self-defense type things, but the reason he needed me was that the head trafficker had a piece of property he wanted to develop into a child brothel sex resort. He needed a few million dollars to build it out. He, he believed he could make tens of millions of dollars a year selling children to wealthy Americans. And the plan was this. I would fly down. I would pretend like I was interested in funding his project under one condition. He would have a party. I would bring a bunch of my rich friends. Uh, he would bring all of his existing inventory of him and the other traffickers in the area. And if I was happy with all their inventory, then I would consider building out this project with him. And, uh, and it worked. It ended up being the largest child rescue operation in one day in history that I knew of at the time, 127 children victims. And, um, and that the thing that changed my life forever was when I was sitting there on this chair and this, this trafficker had brought out these children that they were being sold and they were scared. And this little girl, she was 11 in the movie. You would, you would see her as the girl they called Princess. She was the, the one everybody was trying to find. She was actually there. In real life, she was there at the island of that rescue. Um, the, that jungle scene, that was an entirely different mission, an entirely different country uh, that we were looking for a little boy. But she was there on that island. She was standing there in front of me. I was sitting down. She was standing up, but her eyes were almost even. And all I could see is fear in those lies. And I made a commitment at that moment to myself, to God, and to that child that I would dedicate my life to eradicating that evil. And so I continued um, for the next 10 years, led over 70 undercover rescue missions in 15 countries. And, and through our foundation and others that we have helped to start and to fund, over 5,000 traffic victims have been recovered and, and uh, brought back to their families. And so that's where everything started, was on this little, little island in Cartagena, Colombia. The most beautiful sound that I ever heard was after the agents came and stormed the party, arrested everybody, and the Child Protective Services people came in with the children. And they started laughing and, and singing with those children. And I call that the sound of freedom. It was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard. I started crying and I, I, that's why we named the movie, The Sound of Freedom, is that we needed the world to see what we had seen. Well, it's, what we had heard. you know, thank you so much for that beautiful work. It makes me quite emotional actually. Um, you know, rescuing all those beautiful children across all those countries, Paul, I guess, you know, that, that must have some very deep connotations for you as an adult male when you see that there's an appetite for this evil. And uh, I guess, um, you know, for instance, in our country here in New Zealand, beautiful country, but we know that by the time a girl is 16, one in three will have been sexually abused, one in five boys will have been, and it's not dissimilar where you are. But I guess uh, my point is this, for all of this happening um, I call it the silent endemic, and I'd love to know how you see that. Yeah, I think, that, you know, we look around at, at the massive amounts of resources put into to, uh, curbing the, the COVID-19 spread, yet this epidemic is 
worse by far. And if our governments put even a fraction of the time and money into eradicating child abuse and child trafficking, it would make a bigger impact in this world than everything they put into trying to fight the, the pandemic. And so this is this is uh, this is the, the 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 pandemic of our lifetime. I believe that you know even even ancient uh, scriptures uh, when it talks about how the hearts of the fathers need to turn to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, the the entire earth will be smitten with a curse. Well, I believe that that curse is here because of the fact that the fathers don't respect their children and the children don't respect their fathers because of this generational trauma, this generational abuse. I, I, um, I found myself the end of last year. I looked at the numbers and I realized that actually it was on, now we're in January. So it was almost a year, was a year ago now. Um, I realized that there's more children being sold today than there was 10 years ago. And, and I said to myself, I said, okay, Paul, if your goal is to eradicate child trafficking, you're not doing a very good job. And I realized that every time we went undercover to go rescue 20, 30 children, if not enough was being done to fix the demand, then another 20 or 30 children were being sucked back into that recesses of hell to fill it. And, uh, and I also realized that somebody doesn't just grow up and in their mid 40s decide they're going to go to Columbia and go rape 12 year olds. Chances are they were already abusing children in their own home, in their own neighborhoods. Chances are even before that, they were abused themselves. And so we as, as humanity have to, have to, instead of just fighting fire with fire, we need to prevent the fire from happening in the first place. Well, they, I, I found myself so frustrated that all I was doing was rescuing children who were already raped. What if, what if we could prevent it before, before anybody ever crossed that line? Well, it's interesting. You raise, you raise some really interesting points for child sex abuse and trafficking has been around since time began. This is not new. It's it's not just happening and from the 1980s on. It's been going on since time began. Secondly, a third of pedophiles are female, so we need to uh, not forget that as as a fact, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot that goes on around enabling and gatekeeping as well. Uh, these people don't just operate alone. There, there is a team of people actually around a pedophile, usually, or a trafficker. But also, you know, you, you look at the children that you've rescued, and we know that the biggest group by far are not the children who have been stolen. They're children like I was, who are trafficked from their family and taken out across the country to be sold and leased. Yeah. So is there any thoughts from your perspective about how that type of trafficking can be addressed? Absolutely. People ask me all the time, they say, uh, you know, after they, after they watch the Sound of Freedom movie, they say, okay, now what can I do? You know, how can I help? How can I fix this? And, and I tell them, you know, the worst thing that you can do is go Go be a Rambo and go to Columbia and try to rescue children. Uh, you're you're going to get shot and, and you're probably going to get arrested. The best thing you can do is go home and hug your children. And people are like, well, how, how does that, how does that help? Well, that yes, yes, there are cases of trafficking, like what you see as parts of the movie where a, a healthy family has a child that's taken and put in a container ship and taken somewhere else. But that is that is not the norm. That's a very, very small percentage. The majority of children that are being sex trafficked sleep in their own beds at night, yes. right? 
they're, they're being abused by a babysitter of a family member of a parent, even in some cases. And so, you know, if, if you are a good parent and you want to keep your children safe, having a relationship with your children where they can easily and very comfortably come to you and say, mom, dad, I don't, I don't like it when you tell me to hug uncle Harry, because you know, he touches me weird or, or, or my, my, my friends, when I go to my friend's house, her, her brother, you know, he slaps me on my butt and I don't like it. Or our babysitter is, is showing us pornography and tells us that we should, we should trust her more than you. These are all grooming behaviors. And they're things that your children need to be comfortable coming to you and saying, hey, you know what? I was at school at recess and these boys held me down and they touched me like this. If your children are not able to comfortably come to you and tell you of these things that are happening in their life, then they will hold on to that trauma their entire life, feeling guilty, holding on to this pain and never releasing it. And so having that relationship is so important. And also being able to recognize the signs in children that may not have that relationship with their parents. You know, if you're an educator or if you're a grandparent or you're an aunt or uncle and you, you see your, your, your 12-year-old niece uh, all of a sudden have a radical change in her behavior and 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 uh, who was who was once much very much an, an extrovert and now is an introvert and is you know and it may not be just hormonal changes there's a high chance a very high chance that she may be going or he may be going through something very traumatic when it comes to sexual abuse and when you understand how staggering the numbers are, as you noted, one out of every three girls by the time they're 16 years old have been a victim of sexual violence. One out of every five boys at that age. It's such a huge number that, that if you walked out in your front yard and you looked right and you looked left down your street, Chances are one of those houses is a dangerous place for children. Yeah. And, and so like, it's important. I like what you're saying. The problem is, and that's why I call it the silent endemic, because like yourself, Paul, um, you know, this is horrendous. Where's the noise? Where's the outcry? Where are the billboards? Where's the billion dollar campaigns to put this on? Uh, TV or across media about help protect children, do this, do that. But I want to come back to something because I think it's really important. As a child um, and, and having been trafficked so badly by family and people you should be able to trust, which we know is by far the biggest number, what I'm here to say is children don't speak. Children show us through their behaviour. And so what you pointed out about behavior being out of control or extreme at either end is 100% correct, yes. But what we must do is children won't find the confidence to speak, but they can find the confidence to do a hand signal or you as parents and educators and safe adults can give them something like choose an emoji within your big family group. Let the child choose. Might be a monkey, might be an apple. I don't much care. But if you ever get that sent to you, get in your car and go and get that kid. You know, there's lots of, of ways we can equip children and resource them, plus educate the adults around them. Because, Paul, I don't think the adults know what to do i don't think they know what to look for the education is key yeah 100 percent. we um you know we started 10 years ago in in pushing some of these campaigns that you now see on a lot of airlines you know if you see something say something in the in the airports um you know a lot of a lot of people just don't even know what to look for and they don't realize how big of a problem it is. And, uh, and the challenge is, is that the average person, the average age of somebody 
coming out and speaking about their abuse as a child, the average age is 52 years old. Yes. That's yes. my age, yes. right? I'm, I've, I've got grandkids. I've, I've lived my, my, I've built my career. And, and if somebody is holding on to that pain for so many decades, it's coming out. It's coming out in low self-esteem and anxiety, depression, anger issues. And in some cases, in many cases, unfortunately, it comes out in trauma transfer, in passing on that trauma to the next generation. In fact, sadly, one out of every three people, especially men, if they don't talk about it, if they don't work through it, if they don't heal from it, one out of every three men who were abused as children become contact offenders themselves. Now, God bless the two thirds. Now, this does not make an excuse. You can't say, oh, you know, I was abused. That's why I'm an abuser. No, you have the choice. You have the choice to never, ever, ever pass that trauma on. In fact, two out of every three men who were abused as children never pass it on, and they, they, they become defenders of innocence. But sadly, one out of every three do. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, people ask me all the time, they say, Paul, how can you, how can you go face to face with somebody selling you an eight-year-old child and not have them see that anger and the hatred in your eyes? And my answer surprises them, and it makes some people mad. It's because I don't hate them. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not a sympathizer. I, I put my life in danger to ensure that they never hurt innocence again, ever, that they go to prison. But from a, from a, a Christ-like perspective, I have to look at them and say, what happened in your life? that made you think that it was okay to pass this kind of trauma on to a child. Mm -hmm. And what I wish more than anything is that I had a time machine and then I could go back five or 10 or 20 years before they ever, ever hurt a child mm -hmm. and look in their eyes at that point and say, tell me what's broken. What's broken in your life right now that makes you think that taking that road might be a good idea in any way. And if we can help them heal before, now understand, after they've raped a child, they're wasting my oxygen, right? We need, to, we need to make sure they never, ever have that opportunity to hurt innocence again. But, but globally, we don't have a time machine, but what we do have is literally hundreds of millions, probably billions of people, adolescents, young adults that that have dealt with that kind of trauma as children that if we can help them heal we save millions of children a hundred percent and paul we're gonna leave it there for this part one but um stay right there the um audience you know what a powerful conversation and for you beautiful survivors watching hello as always, I see you, I stand beside you, and I believe you will be back shortly. Mm -hmm.